Hi guys, this is Ms. Romani. This week we're going to be learning about protein synthesis, how we go from having genetic code in DNA, and how is a genetic code in DNA then used in the cell to make proteins. And so before we delve into the details of how protein synthesis occurs, let's just take a very big picture view of protein synthesis by looking at what in biology we call the central dogma of biology. The central dogma of biology makes it sound really important, and that's because it is. It's basically the idea in biology that drives how our genetic code can then drive the production of proteins in our bodies which would then determine what we look like, who we are, how we act, and everything about us. And so the central dogma in biology is basically how that information flows. And that flow of information is very simple. DNA to RNA to protein. And that's it. That's the big picture. We start with DNA, then we transfer the information of DNA into a molecule called RNA, and then we interpret the information of an RNA in order to make proteins. And so what we're going to focus on is the, then what happens, obviously, within each of these transfers of information within the central dogma. How do we go from DNA to RNA? How do we go from RNA to proteins? And so, so when we go from DNA to RNA, that is called transcription. And transcription happens within the nucleus of the cell. That's where DNA is found and that's where RNA is made. So that's transcription. And the second part is called translation, and translation happens outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm, more specifically at the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. And so this is when we go from information in RNA, which can leave the nucleus, and we use that information in RNA to make proteins. And so that's called translation. So before we dive into how transcription and translation works, let's talk a little bit about something called the genetic code. Now, the genetic code is amazing because scientists have been able to figure out exactly how the information that is found in DNA and RNA can then be used to represent the different amino acids in proteins. And the way that our bodies work is that for every three letters in nucleic acids, DNA or RNA. We call those three letters, by the way, codons. For every three letters, we basically use those three letters to represent a different amino acids. And this is something that is done by nature universally on Earth. The genetic code is the exact same no matter what organism on Earth you look at. Say, for example, the letters U, 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 which are RNA letters, those three letters represent the amino acid phenylalanine, PHE, for every living thing on Earth. Every living thing on Earth uses the exact same three-letter code, or codons, and they are translated in the exact same way. And so each codon usually represents one amino acid. Now, if we do the math a little bit, we will find that we have four different possible letters in the genetic code. If you're looking at DNA, the letters would be A, G, C, and T. But if we're looking at RNA, which is what we actually use to look at the genetic code, we will find that the letters are A, G, C, and U. These four letters can then be arranged into three-letter codons. For four letters to be combined in three-letter codons, you end up having 64 different combinations, 64 codons. But there's only 20 amino acids. So you're going to have a little bit of repetition. And so what ends up happening is 61 of the codons will code for 20 amino acids. So there's going to be quite a bit of repetition. Some amino acids will get four different combinations that will represent them. And then that leaves three other codons, and these are called stop codons, also called nonsense or termination codons. And they basically tell the cell that we need to stop the process of making a protein. Whenever those three letters come up, then that's when they know, oh, okay, this is the end of the protein. So these three, the stop codons can come at the end of the gene. And then you have also one start codon, which basically always comes at the start of the gene. And the start codon is AUG. And that is the only start codon that there is. But it is also a start codon that does not just indicate a start, but it also is a signal for the amino acid methionine to be placed. Methionine is 
the first amino acid in every protein because it is the start codon for every protein. When you're looking at the genetic code, there's a couple of ways that it can be shown to you. One of them is in the in the table that you just saw, but another one is in the circle table code. And the circle genetic code is actually, in my opinion, the easiest type of genetic code to use. Essentially, you will start at the middle. So let's say you're looking at AUG. So you're going to be looking at A in the middle circle, and then you're going to be looking at the next letter, which would be U, and then you're going to move out from there. The amino acids obviously have names. There's 20 different amino acids. They have full names. Every amino acid has a, a well-established standard three-letter code that is often used to just name the amino acid much faster and write it out much faster. And they also have a one-letter code as well. So that table gives you that information. So one of the things that we are going to be focusing on when we talk about protein synthesis is the RNA molecule. And RNA is slightly different than DNA. We already spent some time on DNA, so let's spend a little bit of time getting to know RNA. The main three differences between RNA and DNA in their structure are that DNA is usually double-stranded, whereas RNA is usually single-stranded. DNA has deoxyribose sugar, that's where the D in the name comes from, whereas RNA has ribose sugar. Again, the R in the name comes from the ribo part of the ribonucleic acid, that's for the ribose sugar. The two sugars are actually very similar to each other. They differ just in, on carbon number two, the DNA has a hydrogen and the RNA has a hydroxide group. And then the last main difference between them is that DNA has thiamine as one of the bases, whereas in RNA, the thiamine is replaced by something called uracil. Uracil, if you look at the structure, is actually very similar to thiamine. They just differ in that one functional group on that one carbon. There are four types of ribonucleic acid, or RNA, that are found in the cell and they're involved in some way in protein synthesis. So the first type is called messenger RNA or mRNA and this is one of the main types of RNA. This is the RNA that brings the message from DNA outside of the nucleus. So this is in the central dogma that DNA to RNA conversion is done from DNA to mRNA or messenger RNA. It carries the message that is found in DNA in a molecule called RNA. The other type of RNA is called ribosomal RNA. As the name might imply, it is found in ribosomes. So ribosomes are both a combination of protein and RNA. That's what ribosomes are made out of. And so the RNA that is found in the ribosomes is called ribosomal RNA. tRNA is the third RNA that is very important in protein synthesis and is called transfer RNA. Its job is to deliver amino acids into the ribosomes during the process of translation. So they carry amino acids to the building protein. And how these three types of RNA are involved in protein synthesis in detail, we're going to take a look at over the next little while. So I know this is a very general view, so we're going to kind of take a look at the details in a bit. The last type of RNA is called microRNA or miRNA. And this type of RNA is involved in regulation of gene expression. So it can regulate not protein synthesis so much as how often protein synthesis happens. So oftentimes microRNA can attach to mRNA or messenger RNA and silence that act like an off switch so that it can help our cells regulate when proteins are made. So let's take a look at transcription and let's just begin with DNA. So we start the process in the nucleus. This is where transcription happens right there. And this is the process where DNA, information that is found in DNA, is then copied into molecules of RNA. And it all starts with a type of proteins called transcription factors. And transcription factors can attach to DNA. Here's the thing that we need to know about DNA. DNA is a huge molecule. It contains hundreds, if not 
thousands of genes depending on the DNA molecule itself. So you guys are familiar from last year that we have 46 different chromosomes. And so some of them, like chromosome number one and two, are really large and it might contain thousands of different genes. Where some of them, like say for example the Y chromosome or chromosome 21 or 22, are smaller and might contain only a few hundreds of genes. But either way, a chromosome contains a lot of genes. And when we're making proteins, we don't need to make all the proteins in the DNA. And so a molecule of DNA would be like an entire recipe book. And if you're going to say, for example, make chocolate chip cookies and you need to look up the recipe for chocolate chip cookies, you're going to grab a book and maybe that has a thousand desserts recipes on that book. Well, you don't need to make all those recipes. You only need to find the pages that give you the information for chocolate chip cookies. And so that's what this process of transcription is going to be about. It's going to be about copying that recipe for chocolate chip cookies from that cookbook into a recipe card that then you can take into your kitchen because maybe the recipe book was not in your kitchen. It was in your friend's home say, for example, so somewhere else, but you need to take that recipe to your kitchen. So you're going to copy that recipe out into a recipe card and take it in. And so the first thing that is going to happen is you need to find that recipe and you need to be able to open up the book. And so transcription factors is what do that. They open up the recipe book and find the right recipe. And they attach to the DNA a little bit upstream from the gene. What does that mean, upstream? Well, let's say you're going to copy out a recipe for chocolate chip cookies. You're going to open up the book, the recipe book that has the cookies, and you're going to flip through the pages. Now, you don't want to go to a page that comes after the recipe because you would have missed the, the recipe. You want to stop opening up the book before you get to the recipe. So, for example, in this case, the transcription factors are not going to attach themselves right on the first letter of the recipe. They're going to attach themselves a little bit before that, so that when you copy out the recipe, you can get the full recipe. So upstream is a region that is found before the gene, and it's called the promoter region. And so transcription factors attach there, and so does a molecule called RNA polymerase. So transcription factors, think about them as being the ones that open the recipe book, and find the recipe and attach the right spot and then RNA polymerase is the pen that is going to be used to write down the recipe. So RNA polymerase is going to do the job of copying the recipe down. And both of these attach in that region called the promoter region. Now the promoter region is actually easily found within the DNA molecules because they usually have a lot of adenines and thymines. And because of that, because there are regions that are very rich in A's and T's, it's called the TATA box, T-A-T-A -A box. And the reason for that is because if you remember about DNA structure, is that guanines and cytosines are held together by three hydrogen bonds, whereas adenines and thymines are only held together by two hydrogen bonds. So if you have an area in the DNA molecule that has a lot of adenines and thymines, that means that there's a lot less hydrogen bonds holding those two complementary strands together. For no, in order for the recipe to be read, you need to have access to the genetic code. That means that the two complementary strands of DNA need to be separated. And so it requires less energy for the cell to separate regions in the DNA strand that have a lot of adenines and thymines. And so those promoter regions are usually areas that are found upstream from the gene, before the gene occurs, um, that have a lot of adenines and thymines, and that's where both the transcription factors and RNA polymerase attach. So the next stage is that once the transcription factors have attached in order to open up the DNA molecule and RNA polymerase has attached, RNA polymerase will go on and just just like DNA polymerase did during DNA replication, will read the code and instead of bringing uh, nucleotides of DNA into the code, they will bring in RNA nucleotides. So if they read a T, they will bring an adenine of RNA. If they read a, a, an adenine, they will bring a uracil, right? And so the strand that is being copied is called the template strand.
because only one of the strands of DNA is going to be copied. The other strand is called the coding strand. And the reason for that is because the template strand is used as a template to make the RNA, but the coding strand will actually be complementary to the template strand the same way that the RNA is complementary to the template strand. So the genetic code that is in the coding strand will look the same as in the RNA, except that wherever there's a thymine in DNA, there will be a uracil in RNA. And so we get to the final stage called termination, and this is when the RNA polymerase knows to finish copying or uh, transcribing the DNA into a molecule of RNA. And this is extremely important because otherwise the RNA polymerase will continue to read the genetic code in DNA and would make a copy of it into RNA and you would get more than the recipe. It would be the equivalent of you trying to copy down the recipe for chocolate chip cookies in the book, but you don't stop at the end of the recipe. So just keep copying and copying and copying more information and you might get into other recipes as well. And then what would happen in the cell, though, is that the protein would be much longer than it needs to be because it would have way more amino acids that, that are necessary for the number of amino acids that are found in the gene. And so the way that it works is that the transcript or what we call the pre-mRNA is released once that terminator sequence is reached. I have a GIF that shows the whole process. So here you can see RNA polymerase attached at the promoter region, which is in green there, is moving along the DNA strand. And by the way, I didn't mention this before, but it builds the RNA strand on a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So notice that the RNA was built 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And so it has the two strands of DNA, which are separated. The strand that is being raised is called a template strand. And the template strand is the one that runs 3' prime to 5' prime because the RNA polymerase is going to be building the RNA 5' prime to 3' prime. And then the strand that it is that goes 5' prime to 3', that's called the coding strand. And then eventually it hits a terminator sequence. And that terminator sequence basically is telling the RNA polymerase to stop transcribing. We are done. And then the pre-mRNA or transcript, as it is known, that little red ribbon that you see being built there, it's released, and it's going to make its way outside the nucleus. And this is the end of transcription, and this is a good point to stop this video, and then we're going to move on to the next video. And the next video is not going to start with translation yet, because actually there's stuff that needs to happen to the RNA before it actually can leave the nucleus. And those are called post-transcriptional modifications. So these are modifications that will happen to RNA after it is built, but before it can actually go on to leave the nucleus for translation. So if you're ready, you can click the next video now. If you want to take a break, do so, and then you can come back to that. So I'll, I'll talk to you in a bit.